Marlin Model 55 Goose Gun. Give you one guess as to what its claim to fame is. Oof, we're off the tech mat. Man. You might not be able to get this whole thing in frame. But uh, let's take a look at it. What do we got here? The Marlin Official Goose Gun. These were made from 1962 to, I'm not sure, I think it was somewhere around uh, 1990, maybe even later, maybe late 90s. Um, the Marlin book I'm getting all my information from says their current production, but that book is copyrighted in 88 or 89. So they went from 62 to 88 in the book, in the Marlin Bible, Brophy's book. But um, I think I see in some places more modern um, numbers on when they were made to. They might have, I saw 97 once, I saw 95 somewhere. Um, this one is a 1977. Um, there were a few changes as they went down the line uh, through the years. Not really sure of some of the later changes, but we could touch on some of the things. Uh, let's just cover what this guy actually is. And you should really go back, if you haven't seen it already, and watch the Glenfield Model 50 video. The Glenfield Model 50, the Glenfield is a Marlin house brand. And the Glenfield Model 50 is really a Marlin Model 55. Model 55 Hunter in 1954 is where this guy came from. Um, that was the original start for this model. Now, since doing the Glenfield video, I've actually come up with some more information. We're going to look at the patents again. And uh, I think I was able to trace a little bit of stuff that connected to the Ward Westernfield Model 30, which was the Kessler Model 30. Kessler from Silver Creek, New York. If you haven't seen that video, go catch up there. This is going to be a nice tie-in. It's going to connect everything together. So, uh, you know, plus it'll get some more views on some other of my videos. I don't want to speak just from a complete selfish standpoint. But really, um, it would help. For later on what i'm gonna i'm gonna tie it all in you're gonna say that's there's a connection between all of this so what is this guy now this guy is a 12 gauge three inch magnum chamber or two and three quarter inch shells we could do either these were made full choke only they have a detachable two round magazine uh, with one in the chamber that would make it legal for you know like bird hunting with the three shots. Um, they say that some like number two shot shells or double lot buck shells, whatever, might not feed through the mag. They might be too long for the magazine and they have to be single loaded. But for the most part, three inch shells will cycle and, and feed through here with the bolt action. Um, this thing is, uh, this, this year for this time, 77, this was an American walnut stock with the Mar Shield finish. The Mar Shield thing is interesting. If I remember later, I'll touch on it. Otherwise, you know, Google it up. It's well, I guess I could just cover it quickly. I'm not going to get into like, you know, the the complete scientific chemical process. But basically, they came up with a system where they were able to spray the stock with something that could be like negatively charged or something. And then they would, it's kind of like electroplating, but for wood. And then they would spray this finish into this booth and they would charge that since that was negatively charged and they would positively charge the spray, it would stick on the finish. It's supposed to be, uh, you know, a um, way that they would save on the product that they would spray, that it would stick better and adhere better and the finish would be better. It is a pretty cool finish. Um, comparing it to, here is the Glenfield Model 50. 
by the way. So you can see this one is definitely older. This is a 67. And they supposedly started that process in 70. So you can see the difference, how this is more of a matte finish. Kind of like the look of like an oil rubbed finish. Where this is more of a, uh, you know, like a uh, shellacky looking thing. But but it's it's definitely not that cheesy kind of shellac like finish or whatever. It's it's it is pretty cool. It's supposed to be very durable, waterproof. Um, it's claim to fame though, thirty six inch barrel, fifty six and three quarter inch overall length to this gun, eight pounds. The price in nineteen seventy seven was eighty six dollars and ninety five cents. So this 1955 Hunter, I'm going to cover it quick since it is the, it is its, uh, you know, like its dad. That's where it came from originally in 54. They started that gun and um, where they came up with those patents. This is what, this is what we're going to talk. This is where we're going to start rabbit holing. But let me just cover the Hunter year wise. So they started up in 54 with a 12 gauge with a 28 inch barrel, full choke only. Um, in 1956, they added a 20 gauge that had a 26 inch barrel. These were all full choke, two and three quarter only. And uh, in 56, the 12 gauge got an adjustable choke, which, which for Marlin was called the micro choke, which had a ventilated, it ventilated the barrel. And uh, I found the patent to that, and it's actually from the same guys. That these original the original patents for this gun came from we're going to take a look at them again um in 1961 they added a 16 gauge with a 28 inch barrel and the adjustable choke slots uh, for the 12 gauge were removed all right so if, if i said there's slots in it and you said no there's not and you have like a 62 well there you go um by 65 this model 55 hunter was removed from the catalogs already but uh, in 62 is when they introduced this goose gun. This was made to shoot three inch magnums, magnums and regular two and three quarter inch shells. Uh, it was tapped for a receiver sight right here. Um, it came with these, uh, these slings, sling swivels, the, you know, this carrying strap and uh, a gold plated trigger. These are the things that they added specifically for these guys. And uh, the patents for these, let's take a look. We looked at these when we looked at the Glenfield Model 50, but I was not able to completely put this together. This is pretty interesting here. So here are the patents. It's Roper and Wright, Walter F. Roper and Frederick J. Wright. We'll call them Roper and Wright from now on. So there's one, two, three. I have three. I have three right here that everybody knows about. So this one is for the receiver recoil plate construction for shotguns. And notice the date. This was filed in 53. It was approved in 56, but filed in 53. Filed in 53. Filed in 53. All three of these, right? Um, mechanism for bolt action firearms. And this one is for the magazine and how these shells work in them. And they do tilt up high like that. What's interesting is, and I don't, I'm not sure if I have it here, is uh, I'll have to pull it up on a separate, separate page and pull it up here for you, is that these patents were assigned to Savage. Savage owned all these patents. And uh, it was a little curious for me how Savage had these had these patents. And supposedly, where is the paper I had on the Glenfield? Here, here it is. So supposedly, they uh, they bought these patents. Okay, so on August second, nineteen fifty seven, Marlin acquired the rights to the Roper inventions from Savage, royalty free for five hundred bucks. What I think happened was when, now if you had watched these videos, you'd see that Kessler had gone out of business, and I think it was 52. And when Kessler went out of business, they auctioned everything. And not only did they auction their parts and stuff like that, they auctioned off 
the rights to certain designs and stuff like that. And supposedly one of the things that Kessler was working on was a shotgun like this with a really long barrel. This goose gun might have been in the cards all the way from the beginning. Like the hunter started in fifty four and this is perfect matches perfectly for for these patents coming out in fifty three right after Kessler went out of business in fifty two but supposedly this was in the cards the whole time that Kessler had ideas of a long barreled shotgun and the, this is where the whole idea came from and where Marlin even bought these patents and started it up started a production of the fifty five hunter. All had to do with Kessler. Well, anyway, that's the tie-in. And um, here is the fourth patent that I found. This is the Roper Wright patent for the adjustable choke for the micro choke, the ventilated micro choke. And uh, there it is right there. And uh, pretty sure this is another patent that was assigned to Savage. I'll check it to make sure, and I'll pull it up right here. If it says Savage right here, on this one, then it was a savage button. And if it doesn't say savage, there you go. There's another rabbit hole for you to play around with. Like Roper and Wright invented the choke. So these guys, Roper and Wright, they might not have been working for Marlin the whole time. They might have been working for Savage. And that's who had the patents, but or for uh for Nate well, I was gonna say they were working for Kessler. Maybe the patents were even from way back then. You know, like who knows? So how does this thing do? Let's uh, let's let's take a look. What do we got here? So I shot trap with it, and uh, what were my scores? I'm trying to remember. I got a 19. Uh, I think it was a 15, a 19, a 20, and a 22. Those are my four games. I improved each game. And uh, remember, we were talking about. I think it was the Beretta where I was saying. You know, it's so light that it's, uh, I'm like over swinging with it or whatever. Well, this is what I'm talking about. Look at what I'm really used to shooting these big heavy, especially this guy. Man, to swing this barrel, it's tough. But uh, it really, I was doing really well with the errant ones. You know, the ones on the side when I'm on the corners and they would shoot towards the corners where I had to really track them down. It was doing, I was doing really well. I was like, strangely enough, was missing on just the straight ahead ones. But, um, you know, they say with a long, long barrel like this, it doesn't make the shot pattern any tighter. It doesn't make it travel any further. A lot of people think that. It's written in a lot of publications where it says that. But I'm convinced as the scientific guys, the real, the guys in the know say that that's all nonsense. And I believe them. Um, I don't think it matters at a certain point. I don't think it matters how much longer it gets. Like 30 inches or 32 might be just about... I don't think anything's going to change after that. And uh, that's why all the shotguns are at that length. And uh, But what the added length does, it's not like it doesn't do anything for you. It definitely uh, does something. It increases the sight radius. And trust me, the sight radius is very important. It makes it much... Your, your slight adjustments in your aim where you're holding it and looking down the barrel, it, like lining up the sights, makes it much more accurate. Um, so that's definitely a plus. And I noticed that it was definitely much more surgical. Like when you're shooting at these birds, like with this, you really find that you're lining up the sights. You really feel like you're marksmaning it, if that makes any sense. So, uh, yeah, so three-inch shells feed through here. I'll tell you right now, if you uh, if you load this uh, magazine with uh, these are snap caps here, these are two and three quarter inches. If you load this magazine with these guys, it uh, it will not feed. I'll uh, break the suspense right now. It uh, see what I'm saying? It just it'll do that because it needs that longer length. It is actually designed. For uh, the longer length to um, to be able to feed properly, and I know that because I shot three-inch shells in it, um, but I don't have three-inch snap caps, unfortunately. So, uh, but the way to you could load this guy even right from here, you could load the chamber, and then these you could kind of do it kind of like Mauser-esque and just push them down in there. And when you get two in there, you hold them down and you bring the bolt over them, 
and uh, that's how you load up with uh, three rounds. And uh, this again has, just like uh, we had in the uh, Glenfield Model 50, I, I hate to, you know, go over things um, too much. Oh, did I forget a patent over here? No, I, I did, but it's not. See, this is interesting. Uh, it was T.R. Robinson Jr. This was definitely, this one was definitely a, uh, a Marlin patent because this guy was one of the chief designers of Marlin. So even though the designs might have come from the Kessler, let's say, it was this extractor right here. This extractor right here, this clip-on. So here it is right here. You can see it. We've dealt with this. Look back, even though there's a 22 just recently did for Marlin that had this, this extractor with this patent. See how this is just like one piece. It does away with like the springs and fulcrums and balls and pins. It's just a clip over. Pretty cool, right? And, and it works. I'm telling you, I haven't heard... Or read anything online or seen anything about that they break and it you know it you might think it looks cheap compared to these other designs but there is something to be said for it being simpler instead of uh complicated there is uh there's definitely something to be said for that and uh and yet yeah, and that patent is tr robinson jr this is definitely a marlin patent this was 1946 and granted in 49 this supposedly is also one what is it the marlin 336 i think something like that this patent is uh was originally for that rifle and then they carried it over into uh these guys is there another reason i took the bolt out besides that as a cocking a red cocking indicator ring on there that's what that is all right let's get this back in here i'm at a weird angle here i can't really see what i'm doing let me lift it up and go like this Sorry about that. So, yeah, so I could pull this up again. Here's a list of these models, if you're interested. So 54 to 64 was the Hunter, as we spoke about. And the 16 gauge again was 61 to 66. The uh, 62 to 88 is the Goose Gun. But um, like I said, this came out of a book that was copyrighted in 89. So we'll go further than 88 with that for sure. Uh, the Swamp Gun which was 12 gauge with the three inch chamber, but normal sized barrel. That was called the Swamp Gun. That was 63 to 65. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even a normal sized barrel. It might even have been like a 20 inch barrel on there. Short barrel with the three inch shells. That thing was a freaking animal, huh? Uh, 61 to 65 was the Glenfield. So it was the 55G. It's when they first started getting into that Glenfield house brand thing. Um, they just had a G after the 55. Uh, that one was in 12, 16, and 20. And then in 66, they went from the 55G straight up to just calling it the Glenfield, made it the Model 50. And that is in 12 and 20. And ours that we have here is the 20 gauge. That's why it's kind of cool that to have the, if this was in 12 gauge, it'd be a little bit of a duplicity thing going on here. But the fact that this is in 20 gauge is nice. It's a shorter barrel, so it's because it's in 20 gauge. I think it was a 20, with the 26 inch barrel instead of the 28. Where do I have my information? It would be the 26 inch barrel. That's right. Uh, for the 20 gauge. And there was also in 73 to 79 was a model 55 slug gun, which I had some information on that. I was when I was looking around. I, I don't know if that one was a rifle barrel. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember. Well, that one was called the slug gun. Then, of course, from 76 to 85 is the model 5510. That's the 10 gauge, um, three and a half inch shell. That's the super goose. Okay. So if the um, goose gun isn't enough for you, you can always take the step to the super goose and you could go crazy there. So, uh, yeah, at the trap range, I had a uh, had a lot of fun with it. Um, people were bugging out on it for sure. Um, and it, uh, you know, it it definitely 
wore me down. Let's put it that way. It wore me down. It, uh, it's not even so much that it's heavy, but when you have to switch, it's, it's, it's tough on your, uh, it's tough on you when you got to swing it, you know what I mean? Because it's a lot, it feels like a lot of momentum behind it. And, uh, for a couple of the rounds I shot, um, by myself. So it's not like you have recovery in between. I'm just taking one shot after another shot after another shot. And it was like 95 degrees out. So it was like, it definitely felt like work, but, um, but had a lot of fun with it. I, uh, I like the, uh, I like the fact that it's bolt action. It's a kind of cool action to load at the, uh, trap range. Might, a lot of people might think it's a little bit awkward, but I mean, think about it. All these other guns, you're like manipulating the stock and the barrel on the brake actions to move the whole gun back together. The pump actions, you're moving the whole pump, the, the whole thing, a whole, you know, it, it's every single type of action that you think of, you're like, you're really moving a lot of stuff except for the auto loaders, you know what I mean? Where you're just basically pressing a button to close it, pulling the trigger, that's it. But um, these, it's not the auto loaders, but is the the most minimal amount of reciprocating anything for the non-semi-automatics. Um, just because you really don't have to, it's just the bolt. All you're really pulling back and forth is the bolt. So um, it's it's... At first, it feels a little awkward, but uh, it becomes uh, very smooth and intuitive pretty quick. And uh, believe it or not, as much as you would think it looks funny to shoot a bolt action shooting trap, it actually uh, it actually works pretty good for trap. It really does. And uh, you know, come on, bolt action rifles uh, aren't they known as the most accurate? I mean, aren't they? Isn't that why sni sniper rifles aren't pump action <laughs> or lever action, right? Uh, I don't know, thinking that maybe a uh, bolt action is, uh, you know, got something, got a leg up on the competition, you know. And uh, what else do we have? I feel like I'm, I really feel like I'm missing something. Well, uh, I can tell you one thing, the serial numbers with these, can date. you can date them with the serial numbers. Um, the uh, Glenfield, if you remember, we used like a barrel date code, but into these years there was no barrel date code but you would use this thing where you would subtract the first two digits of the serial number from a hundred there's a thing like that or the first two digits could be the serial number uh, could be the date so I think if it's like a set the serial number starts with like a 70 or a 71 that's a 70 or a 71 but quickly in the early 70s it turned into this subtraction method so like this one it starts with 23 so you subtract 23 from 100, you come up with 77. If you see one that says 18, then you know it's like a 72 or whatever. You know, you do the math. Um, so that's how uh, that's how that worked. You can use the serial numbers to date these, which is pretty cool. Uh, you poke around online and you come up with the info. Um, I don't think I saved it. But um, the Glenfield, because it was a Glenfield, didn't have the Marlin Bullseye, but here we go. So yeah, it has a... Well, see, I'm banging it into the wall over here. It has, uh, you know, these came with a butt plate. They have the sling swivels, of course. And this, uh, yeah, that finish is pretty cool, right? There's the thumb safety. This thing was pretty mint, you know, when I got it. it I'm pretty lucky here. It, uh, it's really clean. This sight also, at some point, they changed the sight where they put a notch in it. And, uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure if that was necessary. I don't know if, uh, you know what, I've got the power up over here. Let me just uh, get over here and plug you in. All right, just in case uh, you were going to die in the middle of my video. You know, one time I was making a video, I was like, literally 45 minutes into it, and I looked at the screen and it was just dark. It just, <laughs> the camera died. It's like the epitome of talking to myself in the middle of the garage. Yeah, oh man, it doesn't even look like it's moving. So I yeah I uh, did my uh, my uh, jewelry cleaner of the brass bead. Uh, unfortunately, I did it after shooting. It's so hard to manipulate this thing around. It really is. It's, it is huge. What else do I have here? Yeah, we got some info here. I'll show you some info. Let's get this thing off the table so we can. Oh man, eight pounds. That's a lot. So, yeah, I, a lot of this info I got from these books, so I might as well credit them. The Marlin Firearms book. This is from uh, Colonel William S. Brophy, of course. 
And uh, here is the um, the Glenfield that we um, that we did before this one. But of course, right before it, we have the goose gun. Here's that uh, choke with the uh, slats in it there. And uh, here's where I got the numbers, the pricing. Here's the info on the Swamp Gun. This book has a lot of info on these shotguns. That's pretty cool. So uh, check it out. And then we have not that much information in the Brownells Encyclopedia of Modern Firearms, but we have the Hunter right here. And uh, what else did we have? We had the, and here it is. Here's the Model 55 broken down. Not a lot of parts. Absolutely not a lot of parts. Kind of like a crazy magazine spring right here. Look at that. You got to kind of really know what you're doing here. Actually, I got to look at this again. I think I got this in here wrong. I think I have this part up on the top. This is cool that I saw this. I'm going to have to... You want to do it with me? Let's see if this is backwards here. I could have sworn that maybe I had it wrong. Let's see. It looks like the way they're showing it here, that that's the bottom of the mag there. See what I'm saying, right? This is like boxed, and then that's the part that should just be flopping. And then I think, let's see what I have in here. Make sure I keep that. That's where that one. Hmm. It's not exactly shaped the same, right? There's a notch here. A notch. Yeah, I'm thinking that notch is denoting that. I guess I just have it right. I mean, after all, it was working. And then this was... What was that? This was like this. So that goes in here like that. All the way down. Is that going to go? Maybe like that. Yeah. Like that. All right. We're back. Yeah, I guess that's just the way it goes. The spring... The spring in the Glenfield did look like this, and it was in that orientation, I remember. But then I thought there was something funny with this one. But um, but it does it does feed the three and uh, the three inch shells, but it won't feed the uh, two and a half. But you know, with trap, you drop it in one at a time anyway. Come on, whatever it is, if you don't hit it with one shot, what good are you, right? The goose gun. Yeah, I didn't want to just go over the Glenfield Model 50, uh, you know, information again. Um, I really need to dig in and do some serious research with the Kessler connection there. But I'm thinking, thinking that I read somewhere that Savage bought up some of the stuff, some of the parts, some of the tooling, some of the machinery, the big stuff. You know, like the small guys buy the small stuff, but the big guys buy the big stuff. And I think they bought some tooling and some designs for some shotguns that uh, ended up looking just like this. You know what? I want to get the. Hold on a second. I'll be right back. I want to get the. I want to get the Western Field, and I want to take a look right now with you guys and compare it to this one. So, because I didn't have, I don't have it out. I, I should have. Let me just go get it. We'll do a little comparison. Let's take a look. We'll see how much. I don't really remember what it looks like. Let's really um, let's really take a look and see if we think that there's some credence to this theory. Be right back. Okay, this is wild. This is wild. I am totally convinced, and let me explain to you why. So here's my information from the video on the Kessler or on the Ward Western Field Model Thirty. Okay. Inside all of this info that I had here, when I, I always save all the info from when I do the video, and I just poke through it quick to look, right? And I have in here the patents that I had pulled for that video. And I have the PD Kessler, the actual Kessler patent, okay, for uh, barrel manufacturing, because this has a one-piece barrel, the Kessler. That's what he patented. Remember, I couldn't find receiver or any other kind of patents, and the closest thing I could find that was related somehow, that was connected, 
that I saw on Google Patents was this. This, somehow certain parts of this receiver construction were connected. They connect the patents in weird ways that they show. I forgot what the word is, but they show like a, a, a connection um, from one to the next. And this was in there as a connection, but I couldn't figure out why. Because it's a lever action, right? And then I started I'm looking at the name. T.R. Robinson. Hold on a second. T.R. Robinson. This was assigned to Marlin here. T.R. Robinson. That sounds familiar, right? We just looked at it. We just looked at a T.R. Robinson. He's the guy that did this extractor. Now you'd say, okay, maybe there's a connection there with the extractor. No, no connection with the extractor is the extractor. Remember, it's the extractor that wasn't working. It's the extractor that I was having trouble even at the range that sometimes it wouldn't eject the shell. But look at, the, look at how they look. Look at the similarity in the construction and how they look. Right? But this extractor didn't work. So if somebody, meaning some guy named T.R. Robinson Jr., who was the, uh, is the other one a junior? Is that his dad? No, they're both junior. Both patents are to a T.R. Robinson Jr. But perhaps if you were the lead designer of Marlin and some patents for a gun that looked like this, were dumped into your lap maybe you would take your extractor patent and uh, connect that onto the bolt does this come right out it does it that why isn't it coming out there we go Not that these bolts would look tremendously different, no matter what, but... Hmm. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, there's a connection. There's a connection, and I'm going to figure out exactly what I want to work on it. I'm going to become a detective. Well, I guess that's where we're going to have to leave it. It's just all, it's just all conjecture at this point, but uh, it's a connection with some names. Something going on here. It's a connection with these two patents. 1946, filed 1954. 1954, right when Kessler was being auctioned off hmm. very interesting all right ladies and gentlemen that's the uh marlin model 55 goose gun three inch chamber this thing's an absolute animal and uh yeah i guess if i haven't shown all the video from the trap range yet i'll end with some here i think you guys like that uh, shot with some cool people that day, so if it's footage of me with others, they were pretty cool. I might edit it so that we don't have to sit through it all, or maybe just sit through it all. Listen, what else have you got to do? Sit there and watch some YouTube videos. Uh, I think I lose 98% of the viewers in the first seven minutes anyway. So, if you're still there, I guess you might as well hang in for the whole thing. Yo, we got some cool stuff on the way. Uh, the next one's going to be really, really good. Sit and do a lot of research, get a lot of info, and uh, concentrate good on that video because this is going to be one that I really like, and I want to do it right. So thanks to the new subscribers and everybody else that hangs in there with me. Really do appreciate it. And we'll see you all soon.